Hey everyone, welcome to This Week in Medicine. It's March 7th, 2022. Being March, that means we have a new awareness month. We'll talk about that in a minute. This is brought to you by the Foxhall Foundation. We have an education mission, which we are clearly getting back to soon. We have a uh, foundation center or wellness center. Carrie's doing an awesome job with our nutrition consultations. We have a key active master's program, which is an adult exercise program. And I sincerely hope to get some more people in for yoga and other types of adult classes. Uh, if you know anybody who's interested, have them send me an email. Um, happy to discuss with them. Classes are open times, I think, are Tuesday and Thursday mornings. But we can try and accommodate some other class times as well. This is what the outside of the Wellness Center looks like. Kenzendo Karate and Fox Hall Wellness. I know it's hard to find our site. This is the 5550 building on Friendship Boulevard, but that's not really the address for this location. Uh, the main address for this building is Friendship Boulevard, but this is along the side street near the Elizabeth. I think that might be the corner of the Elizabeth apartment building right there. So this is what it looks like. And we are off in there Friday nights. So the inbox this week, uh, again, my CAT scan report is remarkable. We had people asking how to interpret their uh, radiology reports. This is happening more frequently now that we're having sharing of information with patients for their reporting. Um, I had one email with a positive COVID. That's great news because I used to get a lot of emails with positive COVID. Uh, mass mandates are lifting in the schools. In fact, I think probably tomorrow uh, will be the mass mandate lifting in our local public school system. Prevnar 20 is a new pneumonia vaccine that can be given uh, to people over 50, typically over 60 years old. It's one vaccine instead of doing a Pneumovax 23 and a Prevnar 13. So if you are of that age group and you want to find out if you're a candidate for Prevnar 20, it's a vaccine we now have in the office and it is covered by insurance. <clears throat> the question, to mask or not to mask? It's still an issue. A lot of people still want to wear the mask. Again, there are patients who are immunocompromised, people who didn't actually respond to the vaccine because of being immunocompromised, uh, older patients, people who just are at more risk to get an infection. And for them, I think we all owe them the respect of respecting them if they want to wear a mask. And if we're in a setting with someone who might be on chemotherapy or immunocompromised, uh, wearing a mask ourselves. Again, no fourth shot is needed. There's a special circumstance if you are a patient who's immunocompromised or you currently have lymphoma uh, or on a, uh, a chemotherapy regimen that may have made it so that you didn't respond. But typically for most of us, we don't need a fourth vaccination. Uh, finally, leading up to um, what is March Medical Awareness Month? When is my colonoscopy due? We'll talk about that. And I also had an email about my abdominal pain this week. Is it a urinary tract infection? So we'll talk a little bit more about abdominal pain Typically, urinary tract infection is going to be pain below the belly button. So the belly button is a very useful frame of reference. If we are trying to do a virtual appointment by email or we're doing a virtual appointment, let's say by telephone, if you can tell me the location of your abdominal pain relative to your belly button, that's pretty helpful. So March, here it is, Colon Cancer Awareness Month. There's an increasing frequency of colon cancer in the 20 to 50 year old age category. So we're seeing a lot more young people with colon cancer. And the type of colon cancer is interesting. These genetic variants are being analyzed in academic medicine right now. So we will know more and more about this over the next couple of years. The recent decrease in age for first colon cancer screening is now age 45. So we're not talking about age 50 anymore. We're talking about first Routine colon cancer screening discussion should be happening at 45 years old, earlier if you have a family history of colon cancer in specified syndromes. There are many unscreened patients, and we have uh, a backlog of people who need colonoscopies because of the pandemic, making colonoscopies more difficult to perform and schedule. We'll discuss ColoGuard, the fecal occult, guard, uh, fecal occult card, I don't find it's useful anymore for colon cancer screening. I really think the mainstay should be Cologuard, which is a DNA screening test, and colonoscopy. So I find the fecal occult card is really less helpful. 
And a colonoscopy is used specifically not just to diagnose if you have polyps, but we actually remove them. So this is a great procedure. There's no other magical way that we can get your colon to shed polyps. We have to take them out. If we don't take them out, certain types can turn into colon cancer. So back to the completion of our talk last week, we talked about hernias. Uh, we talked a little bit about endoscopies. I just wanted to highlight that an esophagogastroduodenoscopy means we're putting a scope into the esophagus. Gastro is the stomach and duodenum is the first part of the small intestine. That is the upper endoscopy. Colonoscopy is the lower endoscopy. So you might hear us talk a lot about endoscopy. That could be either going from above or below. So an endoscopy, that term is to apply to any scoping of your intestines. So that's uh, a general term, whereas EGD is specific for upper and colonoscopy is specific for lower. We're gonna talk a little bit about tortuous colon, just a little because it's one of my favorite subjects, uh, and small bowel obstruction, which also can be called an ileus, like the word ileum, which is part of your small intestine. So we were gonna, what we didn't talk about last week was bowel obstruction. So a bowel obstruction could be an actual mechanical blockage. You could have a tumor in your small intestine or your colon, or you could have what we call adhesions, which are scar tissue. Scar tissue can form from having previous surgery. So if you had surgery to your gallbladder, or even if you had a C-section, the body's natural response to that kind of surgical invasion, or even if you had appendicitis, uh, or if you had an infection in your abdomen, like a ruptured diverticulum that led to infection, that all creates scar tissue. So either scar formation from healing of an infection or scar formation from a surgical episode, like getting your appendix out. That can lead to tissue that can then encircle the intestines and that encircling of the intestines can somewhat strangulate your intestines so that you can't move gas and other products along the intestines. That can create a blockage, that's very common. And then you need surgery if it won't reverse on its own to cut out those adhesions. The only problem is every time you do surgery to cut adhesions, you could create more adhesions. So this kind of bowel obstruction, a mechanical bowel obstruction is a dicey issue. It could also be that the bowel just stops squeezing. Our intestine and our colon are constantly squeezing. It's a neurologic reflex arc. There is nerve tissue on the intestines and it causes a constant squeezing of the colon and the small intestine. So an ileus actually means that ileum, part of the small bowel, has stopped and it stopped doing its squeezing. So it's not quite a mechanical obstruction, but it creates a, an obstruction because fluid and other material is not moving down the pipeline. Part of the small bowel is the ileum, so that's why we call it ileus. There are things that can cause it like narcotics, so if you have to take pain pills, anesthesia besides narcotic anesthesia. So sometimes when you're under for surgery, you will get fentanyl. Fentanyl will definitely slow down the bowels, but so will general anesthesia. Infection definitely can stop the bowels from working, so we often look to see if someone has a diverticular abscess or even just a virus in the colon causing stoppage of the bowels from moving. And then inflammatory disorders or autoimmune diseases like Crohn's disease can also cause this squeezing phenomenon to stop. Tortuous colon. So your colon, let, remember what I said about the frame of reference being the belly button? The belly button on this guy is right here in the middle. On here, it's right here in the middle. So you actually do have colon that can go above your belly button. This is the beginning of the colon called the cecum. The cecum is the biggest part of the colon. It's the riskiest part for colon cancer. It's right next to the small intestine. So this is the beginning of your small intestine. It goes straight up. That's called the ascending colon. Transverses across your abdomen, transverse colon, and then the descending colon that leads to the rectum and where you have your bowel movement. This is a straight shot, right? If you look at this picture, zoom, zoom, zoom. You are getting the stool to move along. The colon extracts the water from the stool. That's the colon's main function is to get that water out and recy recycle it back into your bloodstream. Um, so it's a straight shot, but not if you have torturous colon or redundant colon. So this is my attempt to find a picture of a redundant colon. I couldn't really find a good one, but I hope you can appreciate 
that this colon is twisting. It's not quite the straight shot of this colon picture. So it comes here, it loops back up around the, what we call the hepatic flexure. Over here is the splenic flexure because that's where the spleen is on the left side. This is where the liver is on the right side. And I tried to demonstrate with these pictures that this colon is looping and twisting. This colon here, same thing, looping and twisting. And I want you to imagine, think in your mind, if you're trying to get waste products out, wouldn't it be easier to go up, over, and down instead of navigating all these loops? And so if you have tortuous or redundant colon, it is harder to empty your colon. And so these are the kind of patients who need more fiber in their diet. Maybe they really do need to take a fiber supplement. It's not because they don't have a high fiber diet. It's because they need so much fiber to navigate these loops to evacuate their colon. So that's what we mean by torturous colon. We mean a twisty colon. Your gastroenterologist might note this on your uh, colonoscopy report. It's very helpful to me as your primary care doctor to let you know that, yes, this is what I saw in your colonoscopy report. So you have a good reason for having a hard time evacuating your colon. It's a normal anatomic variant. There's no problem with it other than it means that you might have constipation. So to colo or not to colo, that is the question. The reason I put the microscope here is that the microscope helps us decide if you should have a colonoscopy because you do have another option if you haven't had precancerous polyps and that is the DNA test ColoGuard. So we are looking for a polyp because they can turn into cancer. The hyperplastic polyp doesn't necessarily turn into cancer, but these sessile serrated adenomas, tubular adenomas, villus adenomas, tubular villus adenomas, all of those kind of adenomas can turn into cancer and we see that tissue under the microscope. We can't see this during the colonoscopy. All we can do is take it off. So it's removed, then it goes to the pathology lab. They look at it under the microscope and about seven days later, seven days, they will tell us what kind of polyp it was. Sometimes it's even normal tissue. Sometimes we're even taking a sample of normal tissue that's faking us out, making us think it's a polyp. So I cannot tell you, as my patient, if you had a normal or abnormal colonoscopy until we get that pathology report, because we might have just removed normal tissue. So it's always important that I get the pathology report, which I probably don't get, about 75% of the time. So I am calling your gastroenterologist's office to get this report because that's how we decide when you get another colonoscopy. It's based on the type of polyp, the size of polyp, the location of polyp. So all of this data comes into the calculation of when you get your next colonoscopy. Is it a year, three years, five years, seven years, 10 years? If you had polyps, but they were normal tissue, you could probably even skip your next colonoscopy and substitute it with ColoGuard, which is a DNA test only for people who have not had these precancerous types of polyps. Again, that's why I need the pathology report to help make that decision for you. Age is not a preclusion to screening. Some people are told not to get any more colonoscopies after age 80, but that's based on average life expectancy of 84. And as we've discussed before, in our community, average life expectancy is at least 90. So the decision on whether to colo or not to colo is an individual decision, and you and your doctor need to make that decision because there are clearly people who should be getting colonoscopies in their 80s because their health age may be younger than 80. You could be 80 years old, but you're so healthy, you're like a 60 year old. So that does dictate when you should get your colonoscopies and when you should stop. It's not that a colonoscopy is a risk-free procedure, but there is enough colon cancer that it still is a good question to sit down and talk with your doctor about what is prudent for you in terms of doing your last colonoscopy. This is the ColoGuard test box. Again, you can't do this if you've had precancerous polyps. This test is not for you. This is the bracket that goes under the toilet seat. This is the bucket that goes in the bracket. So then you comfortably sit on your toilet seat, have the bowel movement in the bucket, pour in some DNA preservative, swab your specimen, put it back in the box. And as I tell my patients, ship it to Wisconsin. That's where they do the testing. Again, it's only for people who have not had a precancerous polyp. Once you've had a precancerous polyp, you cannot do this test again. It's FDA approved for every three to five years. If you've had a hyperplastic polyp, 
you can do this test. Again, we look at it under the microscope. Normal tissue, okay, you can do a cologuard. Tubular adenoma, not okay. Once we have one of those under the microscope and we tell you we removed it with your colonoscopy, you cannot do cologuard again. Sessile serrated adenoma, this is another type of precancerous polyp. You can't do cologuard once you find this on your colonoscopy. If you have a family cancer syndrome, first, two first degree relatives less than 60 with colon cancer, you cannot do cologuard. If you have a genetic syndrome like Lynch syndrome, which is called non-hereditary uh, hereditary non polyposis colon cancer, um, you cannot do this test. It's okay to do this if it's your first colon cancer screening test. You do not have to start with a colonoscopy. Sometimes I do recommend patients start with a colonoscopy, especially if they have hemorrhoids and we want to get a better look, or if you have constipation, or if you have any symptoms, and it's not just screening, then of course you get a colonoscopy. But if it's your first colon cancer screening, you could do this test, especially now because it's a little difficult to schedule it. Again, not if it's hereditary non-polyposis colon cancer, not okay. Not if it's a genetic syndrome. Not all colon cancer is genetic though. So if you have a relative who had colon cancer, uh, you probably still could do Cologuard. It just depends on your family history and your family tree. Tony's tip of the week, for your pre-op appointments, make sure the pre-op sheet is sent to us prior to your appointment. It's not a form I'm filling out, it's actually an appointment. The form is so that I know when your surgery date is, if you need blood tests, if you need an EKG. The anesthesiologist will definitely cancel your surgery if you have not been seen by me and I have not filled out this form. It's very rare that they will let us just fill out the form. That almost never happens. The form is a history and physical form. That means they want your medical history and a physical exam. So we do have to do it. You don't want your surgery canceled. So send us the form well in advance. And it's not something you have to send, the surgery office sends it to us. So just tell them to send it. And then remember, your blood test may take 24 hours to come back. So if they want blood testing prior to your surgery, schedule that in as well. So fast pitch, March is Colon Cancer Awareness Month. Are you up to date with your colon cancer screening? Do you know anyone who's 45? Are your kids 45? It's okay to ask people if they've had their colon cancer screening. This saves lives. Some people still do need to mask, so remember we're all respecting those who may be immunocompromised and don't want to share that information with us. So if someone's wearing a mask, that's okay. And remember to send us your pre-op form if you do have a surgery scheduled so we can see what you need and how timely you need it done. Again, remember your health pyramid and make sure you address all of these aspects of your health because one part of your pyramid falling apart will make the whole thing tip over. And our book is still available. You can prevent a stroke. And remember, vascular disease is really just natural aging. We don't need to call it a disease. We're all going to get it if we live long enough. We can proactively work against it. And that's what the book tells you. Uh, please subscribe and hit like. You can subscribe through a Google account. Thank you for your attention and have a good week. Also, because we have less volume in the global pandemic, at least locally, and there's less to say, we're probably going to decrease the frequency of these talks. You've been very patient and kind and paying attention, um, but there's probably not as much news to disseminate. Uh, we do like the educational mission of the foundation, though, so we will certainly continue to educate. Thank you again.